great lineup of speakers and we have so many people from all over um like you said denver brooklyn miami netherlands um i'm very excited to be here working out for me um has been a chore but since the pandemic i have to say there has been so many great advancements in technology like things on my wrist things i'm streaming virtual reality sometimes i'm working out with my oculus so i'm very excited to hear um, from jordan shelby luke heather um, a little bit about me i am the founder of TechSesh. i have a blog dedicated to the intersection of lifestyle and technology and we focus on different ways to make life easier and better through tech so we're always reviewing gadgets and apps and all the latest innovation. So without further ado, let's get to the panel. And I would love for you all to please tell me who you are, where you're working, what you're working on, and tell me, are you a morning or evening worker outer? Let's start with you, Heather. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. I'm Heather White. I'm the founder of Trillfit. We're a boutique fitness studio that's based in Boston. Um, and the pandemic has been really interesting for us, right? We started off as a regional phenomenon and quickly became global um, through our fight for racial justice in the wellness industry. The biggest thing that I'm working on right now is managing our expansion plan because we've blown up so much. We're opening new flagships across the country. We're expanding into different markets. We're investigating international. Um, and I love working out in the morning. It's the best way for me to wake up. Um, it's part of my morning routine. And I always do a trail fit class um, when I wake up. Awesome. Jordan, let's get to you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I try to work out in the morning. I usually fail and end up working out late at night. Um, but uh, I aspire to be an early morning worker outer. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I run the Techstar Sports Accelerator. Uh, we invest in 10 early stage companies every year. Uh, this is our third year. Uh, before that, founded a company called Coach Up. It's a marketplace for kids and coaches. We do a lot of lessons, thousands of lessons every week uh, in sports as well as yoga, dance, fitness, and other categories. Um, and uh, yeah, excited to be here and talk about fitness. Great. And let's get to you now, Shelby. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shelby Vaklu. I am so excited to be here and so excited to see that people are interested in the in this fitness tech space. Um, so I am the senior director of data at Strava. Um, Strava, for those of you who are not familiar, is the leading social platform for athletes and the largest sports community in the world. We have over 80 million athletes and in 195 countries. Um, so my personal fitness philosophy is I try to sneak in a workout whenever possible. So um, sometimes that's actually during a meeting when I get on my treadmill and just listen to the rest of the meeting on my treadmill. And so, you know, I, tr I try to not uh, uh, go too hard on myself if I, if I don't get my workout in the morning or the evening. Anytime that works is the best workout. <laughs> Great. And then finally, last but not least, we have Luke. Hi, everyone. My name is Luke. Uh, excited to be here. I, I work at Fitbit on the product team uh, focused on our services growth, primarily our, our premium health and wellness subscription. Um, excited to, to chat more with everyone on this call. And uh, I, I've flip-flopped. I used to be a morning workout-er, and uh, I've found that since COVID, my commute time has been sort of consumed by meetings now, so I often work out at night. Uh, which I'm making work, but I at some point want to get back to working out in the morning. I think that's the most peaceful time early in the morning when, when no one can interrupt you. Awesome. Great. Well, seems like we're actually all trying to get a workout in, so that's really great. Um, let's get straight into it. Right now, I want to talk about data. You know, data is king when it comes to fitness. And more and more people want to have that data at their fingertips. They want to know about um, when the, they have the best sleep quality, how many calories are they burning? They want to kind of get like a holistic approach. So I'd love to know, um, you know, at Strava, Shelby, what exactly are you guys doing to provide that data for your audience? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, data and fitness is something that Strava really wants to sort of keep connected. Um, you know, we, we definitely want people to be able to record all their activities, anything that's meaningful for them. You know, our, our standard philosophy is if you sweat, you're an athlete. So whether you think of going and taking your dog for a walk as something that's part of your fitness or whether it's an actual workout, whether you're 
you know wh whatever it is that you're that you're doing you should be able to you should be able to record it you should be able to have meaningful micro data associated with it show up as part of your narrative um, and then you should be able to aggregate it and make sense of it across not just your own story but comparing it to other stories like the rest of your community and how you'd find more sort of meaning and connection through using that data and and connecting with the rest of your community Great. And then uh, what about yourself, Luke, on that aspect? You know, you're working on the premium services. Um, would you say that Fitbit has some sort of strategy where they would provide more data if they enlisted in something more of like a premium amount? Yeah, we uh, we focus a lot on making sure we empower our customers and our premium members with uh, data to learn more about themselves, their bodies. Um, uh, a sleep score is something that's uh, pretty well known for Fitbit, which is like you wake up in the morning, if, if you have your Fitbit on wrist, you can open up the mobile app and you can see what your sleep score was for the night, you know, zero to 100. Um, and there's, uh, for premium members, you can see what's behind that sleep score. So what's the personalization behind it, um, focused on like your resting heart rate and some of the more specific data that we, uh, we think is important to surface. Um, so yeah, I think data is baked into to everything at Fitbit. It's sort of, I think, uh, a core thing is figuring out how do you not overwhelm with data? How do you pick and choose what's the right data to surface? Because there's so much of it available. It's important to sort of focus in on or help to focus in on the right areas. Absolutely. And I think at some point, data and technology was a little gimmicky, but now it's the norm. You see all these studios, they're quickly adopting heart rate monitors and wearables um, and really trying to hold their clients accountable and sort of gamify sessions. So Heather, I'd love to hear your approach. You've been getting so much press. You, We were on a call earlier and you were telling me how you helped Boston turn things around in the fitness space. I'd love to hear what you have been doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think to go back to your original question, data is such a powerful resource for a consumer to have regardless, right? And I think it's really important to make sure that that same consumer is empowered with the contextual information to process and understand what that data means because everyone is coming from a different perspective. So we very intentionally put our studio in the heart of Roxbury in Boston because that is an area where the life ex expectancy rate drops 30 years um, from downtown Boston where most of the boutique fitness studios are. So that was a data point that we built our entire business plan around. And um, um, the interesting that happened is a lot of people didn't believe in that, right? A lot of people said to me, hey, you're opening a luxury boutique fitness space. Why would you ever put it in an area where people die earlier and where they have less income? How will they have access to these resources? And for us, it was really important that we diversify the space. There was no place to work out um, in Roxbury. It just did not exist. And so we created that. And what we proved through TrillFit launching its first flagship is that one, you can redefine the way that luxury boutique fitness feels like and looks like for people of color that too using public health statistics and data can be a central piece of your business plan and you can still be profitable and run a great PL with that um, and three the largest thing is that you can put health back in wellness and I think that's the most exciting thing for me as we look at data is because um, the wellness industry is like a four trillion dollar industry that's based on making people feel like there is something wrong with their bodies and that they don't feel well and that fitness wellness classes shakes wraps massages are going to make them feel better to use data at the core of that and to say hey your heart rate you know your heart monitor tells me this about you or you're actually a diabetic and here are all of your statistics and this is how wellness is going to help you i think that tech in that sense can be quite transformative as long as we provide the the context around the data points so that the everyday American person can understand what that data means because there is still an education gap, there's a skill gap, there's a resource gap there. So we need to make sure that the consumers actually understand because not everybody is an elite athlete, but every person with a body is an athlete. Absolutely. I love that you mentioned that, that data that we give that's at our fingertips. What is the best way, just from a data standpoint, Shelby and Luke and Jordan, uh, I'll get to all of you, Jordan on the on the investment side, Luke on the product management side, and Shelby on the data side, how do you relay that information to, to your audience, whether they're checking on their phone or an app or on the computer? What's the best way to organize that, especially because the people on here that are, are watching are on the product side? How do you make that product 
um, and the data sexy for people to understand and also to continue in terms of a user interface to want to come back and read and understand. And whoever wants to go first. I can jump in. Well, one thing we think about with data is making sure that it's contextual and that we're sort of showing the right level of data at the right time. So a concrete example is the Fitbit app. Uh, when you open the app, you land on a dashboard that shows you sort of like your health tiles and you can get information about your sleep, your exercise, nutrition, mindfulness. And so on those tiles, we like to figure out what is top of mind for customers, what's like the high level uh, a hierarchy of data, what's the, the top level data point that's important to show. And then if customers want to go deeper from there, they can tap on that and go to a, a second level page that has more real estate, more room to show more data, more trends. Um, but it's important to, uh, to think about showing it in some sort of a hierarchy, which is like customer facing, what's the right data in the right context to show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so for companies that, you know, don't necessarily have all that information at their fingertips, what would you say in the fitness realm are the most important, the three key that everyone wants to know more about? I think um, on our side, customers are most interested in the number of days that they exercise. A lot of our customers have goals to say like, hey, I want to get to three out of seven days of exercise. So that's a top level data metric that customers will tap into. Um, and we can help auto track exercises with the on risk capabilities. Notice you go on a run, uh, notice you're working out. Um, another one people care about is, uh, is, is still the steps. Fitbit has been uh, known for being a step tracking company. It's still top of mind for customers. But a third piece that we're excited to move towards is more about the active zone minutes, which sort of like measures uh, when you get your heart pumping and how often you get your heart pumping. So I think that's a third data point that customers are increasingly more interested in. Great. Uh, Jordan, on your side, um, in terms of investing in different companies, uh, what exactly are you looking for when you're talking to uh, companies and the data that they're providing or receiving? Yeah, hard, hard to give kind of a generalized answer, but um, it would just be more specific around some of the fitness companies lately that I've invested in, um, the at-home space. Um, you know, really looking at ways that you leverage data to make it more competitive. So if you're working out at home, it's kind of a lonely, you know, exercise. And so Fight Camp is one company that we're in that, um, you know, tracks the amount of punches that you throw. So I can actually be sort of like boxing against my friend and they're in their house and I'm in mine and I can sort of track our workouts, who's throwing more punches or, or rowing. We can actually, with Ergata, another one of our portfolio companies, I can race against my friend, even though we're not on the water wearing wetsuits at 6 a.m., we're, you know, in our own houses and we're separate, but uh, we can still have a very social gamified experience. So I think it just makes it more competitive, makes it more fun, you know, ultimately pushes people to get a better workout in when, when it could be a, a social experience. And it's funny that, you know, we used to think we had to go to the gym to get kind of that social element. And, and as far as just the actual working out piece, you can actually get generally a more social experience now with all these at-home solutions. So um, using data to make it a more competitive and social experience, I guess, would be uh, my answer. Yeah. And just to build on that, Gordon, because I feel like Trillfit has seen a lot of success with that, where it's like when the pandemic happened, people are still looking for that sense of community and that sense of togetherness, even though they might be isolated in their homes. And data is a great way to bridge that gap where it's like, okay, I, I threw 300 punches today, like, like, Luke, how many did you do, right? Like giving people those things to like ask other folks questions about, I think is really important. And I think anytime we're talking about data, like, yes, we understand the value, but you need to have that contextual wrapping to make it compelling for consumers. It has to do something. It has to either compel you or motivate you by saying, hey, here's like what my resting state is or what my foundation is. Let me try to build it to this progression. Or it's like, let me build community with this. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what my friend is doing. And now this is something that we can do together and we can motivate each other and we can hold ourselves and each other accountable with the data that we're receiving from these various services and trackers. I think building off of Jordan's point too, I, the Shelby Strava does such a good job. I am a, a big fan of Strava in the way that to Jordan's point, Strava uses uh, data in a competitive way to help surface like how you're competing against different segments, whether you're running or cycling or anything else. Um, a big fan of, of Strava's approach to that as well. 
Yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, to sort of add to what all of you said, and especially to Heather's point, ultimately figuring out like every, every individual has different things that motivate them. Like some people are driven by the strive to improve, like I want to improve my performance. Some people are really in it for the community, like this is a way for me to feel connected with other folks who are in different parts of the world, I, I'm no longer able to see them, or I was never able to see them because they were in a different part of the world. And I think creating those tools to help people you know, actually do more on the on the aspects that do motivate them. For some people, it's just health. Like I want to improve my health. And it is not it is not about sort of uh, being the best athletes. It's it's just about improving my own health. So finding finding those uh, those pockets of motivation and then addressing it through our data, through our technology, through the way we package some of our uh, some of our products is 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 what I think uh, needs to happen for us to sort of continue making continue addressing very diverse needs that uh, that people have um, and actually giving them good solutions for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now I want to sort of talk about the future. So more and more gyms are opening on again and people are returning. Some, you know, are still doing that home workout. So many great devices have come around like the Peloton. Um, there's the mirror, there's fitness apps. Um, how do you see these bigger gyms utilizing technology? You know, are they going to incorporate wearables, um, for everyone to use, for example, pre-COVID, maybe that could have happened. Or where do you see um, the, the, the fitness, cl fitness classes going towards now? I'm just curious to know, like, will, where, will these gyms incorporate more wearables and more fitness tech that everyone can use and then just clean up right after? Or is it just going to be the own device they wear, wear themselves that can connect to the devices that they're using at the gym? And Heather, it seems like you kind of have an idea. I'd love to hear what you say. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 really interesting because I think right now for the average studio there are three ways in which you can kind of respond to that, right? So the first idea is having people use wearables in the studio. Um, if it's their own, cool, that works. No studio that I know or would recommend in a post-COVID world would ever say we have 30 Fitbits on site and we clean them afterwards and like we're, we're going to build that way because it's just not sustainable and it's not safe. Um, everyone's concerns about health are different coming out of COVID as well. So any sort of sharing situation isn't going to work. What I have seen a couple of people do so far is there are a couple of studios who now have Peloton bikes in their studios. And so studios that were not previously offering spin classes now have the opportunity to add a different revenue vertical to their business by partnering with a company like Peloton while also reducing, um, the, the cost barrier, right? To If I can't purchase a Peloton myself, but if I know my gym has one and I just have to sign it out and I can use it at whatever time, right? That's now an option for me and that's different. What I am most excited about and most hopeful about and what Trillfit is really focused on is partnerships directly with this brand because uh, the most expensive thing and the most valuable thing people have right now, it's communities that are willing to spend money to be honest and authentic communities. So for example, when I think about the future of fitness tech and what that means for Trillfit, it looks like Trillfit partnering with a Fitbit or something like that to create a unique product that is specifically tailored to the black community as part of Fitbit's commitment to racial justice and moving forward. And it's marrying those two things from a campaign perspective together while building content that reinforces it with the community that will ultimately lead to sales. So like, we're not a business that's just gonna get a Peloton inside there. We're looking for deep and um, substantial partnerships that are truly compelling to the audience because um, consumers are really smart now. They know when it's an ad, they can smell a gimmick. Um, they know what they need and absolutely what they don't need. And so, you know, when they trust you and you, when you have their advocacy and their buy-in already, you're able to offer them a different level of product. And if that product is made with them in mind, if it is curated for them, they're 10 times as likely to purchase that service. Great. I love that. Um, did anyone else here want to answer that question as well? All right. I think something I always think about, I used to work in, uh, growth acquisition. So a lot of paid advertising and um, omni-channel marketing was, you know, a big focus, I'd say like in the last 10 years, which is kind of making sure you have all these different customer touch points, but you want to make sure you have a singular voice across all of them. And you know, when you email a customer and when you talk to them in the mobile app versus when your customer service reaches out. And now I think given uh, 
vaccine rollouts and, and how we're approaching a, a, a post-COVID world. There'll be some things that carry over, some things that don't from COVID. And I think it's interesting thinking about sort of like omni-channel for fitness, right? There's, you have, uh, you have Peloton at home workouts, you have gyms, there's going to be some marrying of the two. Uh, you have indoor, outdoor workouts, you have customers who, who simply just want to go out on a hike and you want to start to marry the voice across all of these different experiences. So I think really interesting thinking about the next couple of years, how the, and the omni-channel marketing approach will apply to kind of like omni-channel fitness. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot to be done there. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Luke. And like my background is in marketing. Like I ran consumer marketing for New Balance and Puma and a lot of stuff. And I think more and more consumers will want tech that travels with them across all of these different destinations that they're traversing um, in a way that makes it easy to understand that's still motivating to them. The one piece I think that you missed though is I think they're also interested in having like a fitness tech wearable that also incorporates their health data which doesn't exist yet, right? And I know at Trillfit, we're starting to ask ourselves the question, like for example, if we own, like, cause our studio is still closed. If we only open the studio to humans who have been vaccinated, how do we prove that? Where do we keep their vaccination data? That's technically their medical data, right? How do you ensure that the technology and the software that you're using is HIPAA compliant so that there's no possibility of sharing or anything like that? And I think, now in this post-COVID world, I think that consumers will want more of that so I can directly see, here's the results from my doctor. Here's what that looks like in terms of the exercise that has been prescribed to me. And here's my community on Strava that motivates me to get to the next level that ultimately makes me feel healthier. Awesome. Yes. Okay. So I guess the, the next thing is in terms of like the process of innovation with each company, it's very different. Um, Heather, we've seen you pivot with everything that's happening with COVID and it seems like it's actually helped your business, but in terms of innovating and figuring out what happens next, is there anything else that you're incorporating in your repertoire to, to continue shifting that needle? I think for us, the biggest thing is honestly um, keeping our ears open to the street and truly understanding what our consumers are looking for, right? Our pivot um, was pretty successful. We grew 15% year over year during um, a really, really hard pandemic where 40% of black businesses closed, or we saw a lot of larger peers in the industry close doors like SoulCycle, like Pure Bar. Um, and it was really challenging for us, but we realized that um, the digital model works. We also learned that there's a concrete way to build community through digital. Um, right now we use Zoom for all of our classes so that people can still see each other um, because just having that visual cue is such a huge motivator. So as we think about how we're going to continue to innovate, it's based on a lot of learnings that we've had from these classes, right? We've developed brand new class styles based on what we saw. We saw a lot of moms working from home and bringing their kids to workout classes because they did not have childcare anymore. So we developed a class for moms and their kids because we were like, uh oh, weird that suddenly all these children are in classes, but then we realized, oh wait, they don't have somebody. And so we can build a product that specifically speaks to this type of consumer. So I think the most special thing about right now is that the world is changing. Um, it's a great time to reimagine the future of wellness, the future of tech, the way that those things work together, the way that those things help people to truly answer what consumers need because people's needs are being um, very much refined right now where it's not so much about the incremental revenue spend that you have or like having fun for a lot of folks right now it's survival because guess what they're stuck at home they don't have a job they don't have child care anymore um, their responsibilities have multiplied so they need wellness more than ever but they need our help in in getting them into it absolutely um, and then in terms of the, uh, okay, one second, in terms of the progress um, in the actual wearable industry, you know, we've seen AI, we've seen mixed reality, we've seen so many leaps and bounds, making it really exciting for both the customer and the developer. Um, so I'd love to know on a data point, Shaiva, what exactly um, are you guys investing in and bringing to your audience right now? Sorry, was that a question for me? Yes. Shelby. <laughs> That's the, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, no. Um, so we are pretty agnostic as far as wearables are concerned. Um, you know, we connect with everything, uh, Fitbit, Garmin, all, all, all sort of uh, things. And I think our main focus is to, um, you know, take the experience that people have, like what, whatever data points are being captured on a, on a wearable, like those things are ever evolving because as people roll out new wearables, they have some other additional features and it is our sort of responsibility to again in support of the athlete to make sure that those those connections are also continuing to port over so if there's some new nuance to the data being tracked we want to have that be that be connected to your strava because uh, you know we believe that strava people you people who like to use it want to have all their activities in one place and to be able to sort of look at them holistically because that is what that is what they are they are after so so that is something that we are always trying to do and you know in terms of innovation like we're also trying to just um just make sure we hear we hear our community in terms of what they want. I, I really liked Heather's call out, like, um, you know, sometimes it's also not just about the community we already have, but the community we want to be. So Strava has definitely gone through that moment where we felt that, um, and not just felt like it's a it's a reality that we are not representative of the, uh, you know, of, of, of everybody in the country because for, 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 for a large part, our, our product was very uh, white male centric and that is something that we actively want to change. Like, you know, we don't want people um, who are, you know, who, who are from a different demographic to not feel that they're included in our platform, that we don't want to hear them. So we are now trying to sort of go out and really try to say that, okay, we need to actively um, go out of our comfort zone and figure out what we need to do differently as a company, as a product, to make sure that our product meets everybody's needs and not just, not just you know, to a narrow part of the population. I'm, I'm curious, um, in terms of, you know, what you said is you want to hear your, your, the needs of the people that are using your products that are getting this information. So how long does it take to get that feedback and then implement a change within your product roadmap? Um, that can really vary a lot depending on how intense the change that is required is. Um, you know, sometimes it can be it can be something very small, which is, um, and I don't mean small in terms of sort of how people feel about it, but as a as an engineering change, for example, like it could be it could be that you know we're just we're not using inclusive terms, we're not using um, just things that a lot of people resonate with, and related to gender, that was something that we we made a lot of. Uh, lot of changes that honestly like they were not they were not uh, technically very difficult changes to make um, and it was really a lack of awareness on our part that we hadn't already addressed some of those things in other in other situations uh, yes qom and Q, qom um, uh, that's a strava reference but um, in other cases it is something where we realize that hey our our reach is something that needs to actively expand. There is more research that we need to do. There is more data that we need to get. And we just don't have enough. Um, we want to be thoughtful in the changes that we roll out. It's not based on five people's whims. It's based on what the community really wants and needs. And you know, we want to do our due diligence in making sure that we are not releasing something that we think is a great idea, but it has the capacity to continue causing harm. Like we want to take a step back and really think about that. And I think those type of opportunities where we've identified them, we are um, really trying to sort of be disciplined about our process, add a structure to it, um, and 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 build on what we what we are learning along the way. That if you're making more, if you're deepening our understanding on issues related to this topic, let's try to continue sort of, you know not just educating ourselves, but actually creating an action plan based on that education, which actually shows up uh, rather than, oh, for the next one year, we're just going to educate ourselves about every every little thing. And then it'll be like three years before we do something like that. I think we are very aligned that that is not the strategy that we want to go after. We want to actually have impact as soon as possible on things that we care about. Okay. And so Obviously, at Strava, you guys have a huge customer base, you know, and you did talk about the self-improvement base, the athletes. How do you segment your customers for people who are joining on here? Um, how do you figure out, okay, what are the workout patterns that are going to motivate people that just started working out? What kind of uh, technology are you also using as a machine learning? What kind of algorithms are there that you're figuring out this is this X audience, this is Y audience, and this is how we're going to get them motivated? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, that's, uh, you know, that is something that has continued to evolve for us. Um, Strava for the original app was very much focused on, uh, on the tri triathlete, like, you know, runners, cyclists, and, and swimmers. And over time, we've realized that there are a lot of folks who are multi-sport athletes who are, um, you know, and a, a runner in US can look very different from a runner in Brazil. And um, likewise, like when you start adding more sort of intersections of their demographics, things can change quite a lot. So our sort of perspective is to start actually building out the personas. And we, I mean, there's already been a lot of work done on this, but building out like a mix of um, location, um, sport type that they're interested in because based on the sport type people can have a very different use case that they're trying to get out of it um, and then also motivation you know to uh, you know to something that Luke and Heather both both touched on that if it's a person who's thinking about their health or if it's a busy mom trying to get a workout like those are those are those are very different different things that we are trying to address and if we don't if we don't sort of meaningfully segment them in a way that makes sense to the athlete in terms of how they think about themselves, then we will come up with the wrong solutions. Like we have to align with, with that. So a lot of that is work that's done with our excellent user research team that kind of you know, creates some of these uh, some of these personas that we then try to validate internally through our data, through their data use, like through their use of the actual platform, and then try to tie those things in together and say that, okay, this is the person that uh, is, is, you know, it meets some requirements of like we're actively trying to solve for them over this uh, over this planning cycle and things like that. Uh, I'd also love to hear from you, Luke, as well, in terms of like the product roadmap and how you're segmenting your user base as well at Fitbit. And especially now with the merge with Google, what does that look like? Has it changed? Yeah, I think um, as far as the segmentation goes, I mean, just looking at my screen, let's say there's uh, six customers that walk in the door today. You could say that um, we have varying uh, demographic information. So within account signup, we learn a little bit about our customers, who they are, and uh, a little bit about their goals too. And then three, you know, their early interactions in the mobile app. So you can you can segment customers like the six of us say these six tiles on the screen. You could say we have each different demographic information maybe, and we have a little bit different mobile app behavior on our first day in the mobile app. But there are actually millions of customers who have gone through this, who have looked like each of the six tiles on this screen based on demographic and in-app data. And so it's uh, kind of goes back to like my, my acquisition days, but uh, Facebook is really good with lookalike audiences where they say, you know, tell us uh, who your customers are and we can go target more customers that look like them. And so you can do similar things with segmenting, which is like customer comes in the door, you don't know much about them, but if you pull in some demographic and in-app data, you can say that we've seen millions of customers who look like this customer, and we know the best way to get them on a good path uh, for them is by doing ABC. And so you can start to segment that way. Um, and then in my world with subscriptions, it's really important to think about reducing your churn, right? You want to have lower churn, higher retention. And so the point at which a, a customer cancels is too late. Right at that point, you're in the win back phase and you're trying to get them back onto your subscription. So you want to think about segmenting based on kind of like uh, churn behavior, not not cancel behavior because that's too late. You want to think about the steps before a customer cancels. So you can use segmenting to say, wow, if a customer stops looking at this part of the membership, uh, we know that they're likely to cancel in the next few weeks. And then you can start to re-engage with them and uh, a lot of fun stuff to do around segmenting. Um, and then the piece about the Google uh, Fitbit was acquired by Google last month. And so uh, it's been really awesome. Our, our roadmap is still uh, the same as it was before we closed. So Google has come in and said, you guys know health and wellness really well. Uh, keep marching down that path and uh, let us know how we can help um, uh, support and, and grow it. So it's been great. Uh, okay. Now, uh, Jordan, I have a question for you. You've seen so many great companies come out of Techstars. You also founded a company with Steph Curry, no big deal. Um, so take us through, you know, what would, what do you see as the future of fitness and technology in terms of influencers and content creation? What is that looking like? Do you sort of need to have a big name associated with a big brand in order for it to work? 
Yeah, I'm sure. I, th I think we're seeing like unbundling of a bunch of industries, um, including venture capital. But um, for artists with NFTs now, I think it's like super interesting time. Um, obviously for celebrities with NFTs and for Stacker Labs and NBA Top Shot's probably the biggest example recently, but- And for um, people we're... who are not aware of NFTs, can you briefly explain exactly what that is? Oh, good God. Uh, Non-fungible token, um, basically leveraging blockchain technology to enable to people to like have an identifiable token that pertains to a particular piece of art or music or in Top Shot's case, like a, a, a moment that an athlete did. Um, and you can actually like track ownership of that moment or piece of art or whatever it is through throughout time and through multiple transfers. It's really cool for artists because it enables you to sell something and to be able to get paid on the secondary uh, sale. And so currently if you sell a piece of art or uh, a highlight video, um, which haven't been sold previously <laughs> before Top Shop, but let's say art as an example, like the artist would only monetize that sale the first time, not the hundredth time that that piece gets resold and resold. And so a lot of artists die broke, right? When their pieces are worth, ends up being worth hundreds of millions of dollars many years later, like with NFTs that um, that wouldn't be the case, they'd automatically get paid on exchanges. So um, anyway, but I think the point, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the point I was trying, trying to make is that I think we're seeing like influencers in a bunch of different spaces, including of course fitness, um, have a lot more power and um, understand their value and their ability to monetize. And, you know, certainly the case with star athletes, um, NBA and NFL and other sports as well, um, and being able to play a role in not only startups and venture capital, we're seeing them invest a lot more. Steph Curry and Kevin DeGrant, or LeBron James are great examples of that. Um, uh, not only building their own brands and being able to monetize their audience and their brand by linking up with startups, but also investing in startups. And then I think on the fitness side, there's a bunch of platforms. Uh, OnlyFans, um, though not really for fitness, but um, is probably a, a great example of platform that's really scaled off of influencers being able to monetize their audience and we've seen that in fitness with a, a lot of different uh platforms uh fit plan and, and playbook and um, fit and there's there's a bunch yeah. um so yeah it's been a been an exciting trend and and i think the rise of the trainer as a as a star in their own right um i think is really interesting when i when i started coach up you know, we're more focused on like sports, traditional like ball and stick sports versus uh, fitness. Um, I tell people, hey, like having a private coach is the best way to improve in sports. And a lot of parents and a lot of athletes didn't didn't know that, but it was what every NBA player, and every quarterback was doing to get better in the offseason. So I so partnered up with Steph Curry. That's how he got got good at basketball and became the best shooter uh, ever, I guess, through his private coach. And so enabling every kid to have a coach. But now we see this is those 2012 that I started the company. And now if you're a basketball trainer, you're like, an, it can be an influencer on Instagram and have hundreds of thousands of followers. And so trainers have become stars. And we've seen that in fitness as well, of course, with trainers having their own methods and unique ability to, to reach an audience and uh, to monetize their, uh, you know, their, their thoughts on training and their, their approach. So, um, I, th I think, you know, it's a really good time to be a, to be a trainer. You have a lot of opportunities, a lot of platforms that you can, uh, push product against. And if you have a large following base, even if you're not that good of a trainer really, but you're like very fit and you have a lot of followers, you can monetize that as well in a number of different ways. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting space. So what we're seeing is a trend monetizing content in the fitness space, and then also monetizing data. People are using this data to come up with different ways to, to, to work out, different uh, ways to help people find that my, mind body wellness uh, as well. So we do have a question for you, Jordan. Someone asked over here, uh, what is the latest trend in leveraging machine learning and AI for, for fitness related products? Do you foresee any new innovative technologies disrupting the non-wearables market? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I'm always a little weary if, if any startup pitch sort of leads with the technology versus the customer and the, the particular like challenge that they're trying to solve. But um, I, I've seen way too many AI uh, attempts to like, like leverage an app to be able to just track your like repetitions. I think that in and of itself is not enough or differentiated enough now. Um, but probably the most, most interesting thing is like, when you think about the business model first, so there's a lot of power in having a high upfront purchase AOV, like high, high upfront purchase price. 
Um, you can think of Peloton and the fight camps and Ergatas and Hydros, the World Tonal and Mirror. And you get your acquisition cost back up front. So it enables you to spend a lot of money to acquire customers and you have a subscription thereafter. But a lot of these platforms, they have a leverage, especially if you're a screen to leverage AI, to track your reps as you're doing the, the workout, whatever it is, I think is really interesting. Um, I think that gyms are going to have to sort of create to an earlier, I guess, uh, topic, smart gyms. And so I think AI machine learning will be a big part of that, whether it's putting putting sensors on machines to be able to track repetitions, to be able to have some sort of app that your, your members can use. I think if people are going to sort of old school legacy, legacy big box gyms in the future, and I think 85% of people say that they're like good with their at-home solutions, they're never gonna go back to gyms, but for bodybuilders and for people who really love classes and social element, um, I think people will continue to go back to, to physical spaces. And how do we make those experiences smart and techy and not feel like you're doing something super old school and could otherwise work out at home in a better solution. So whether that's, yeah, sensors on machines or apps with AI, how, what is the trainer's involvement gonna be and how can they leverage um, technology to be more relevant in, in the physical gym space? If everyone has access to a celebrity trainer on their phone, the trainer at Equinox or whatever that's making 20 bucks an hour, how does that person play a role in sort of the future? Um, think is an interesting thing to think about and maybe technology has a, has a role there okay um and i just saw that we do have a q a box i'm going to get to those we have a little bit more time left um so one of the questions is um is there any kpi that and this is for everyone is there any kpi that appeals to customers that stuck out to you outside the heart rate number of days working out i know there are unique things that people track uh, maybe heather or uh, Luke, would you want to answer that? I'm trying to think. Uh, it almost sounds like it's uh, probing for like a, a fun anecdote of what customers like to track. But I think uh, overall a trend that um, I think you can give Whoop a lot of credit for is customers tracking. Generally, you want to see increases in your heart rate variation and you want to see decreases in your resting heart rate. And this in general is like showing you that you are ready for the day, you're recovering, um, and uh, your heart rate isn't uh, super stressed. You have higher heart rate variation throughout the day and night. Um, and your resting heart rate, when it's low, it's a good trend, um, shows that your, your heart is not as stressed. And so I think Whoop has done a really good job of making customers very uh, in tune with looking for it increases in HRV and decreases in resting heart rate. Um, and so we've seen uh, customers on Fitbit also being hyper interested in that. I think it's leading towards uh, a whole new sort of uh, industry in the fitness space, which is like recovery, right? Recovery is becoming a big aspect within our, our fitness space. Um, and it, not unlike other trends, it kind of goes tops down from focusing on athletes uh, down to more regular consumers. And so, you know, it's like the whoop like customers and like the hyper ice and all of the type of recovery things you can do, uh, I think is an interesting trend that's picking up. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Mind body actually put out a wellness index last year that named recovery the fastest growing vertical in wellness, which I have definitely seen. So I think that's super true. I think the only other like piece that we have to think about from a nuanced perspective is like, with those um, advanced data points that Luke was just talking about, it's understanding who is the audience for that and who really cares. Um, like the people who come to TrillFit don't care about the differences in their resting heart rate versus them being at active like prime performance times um, and things like that. The biggest thing that that they care about and the biggest thing that affects like their future purchase behavior is the time period in which they're attending classes and the time period in which we're, we're um, they're taking the actual classes. So for example, I know that if we acquire a new customer and they come in either three or four times in the first seven days that they've heard about TrillFit, they are 65% more likely to convert on a full year membership versus people who don't do that because they've experienced the class X amount of times, they like it, they've met a couple of people, these other different things have happened, right? Maybe they've pushed themselves harder in seven days than they have previously. Um, and that's a metric that we, we really use because it shows to us consumer sentiment um, and it shows how much they're liking it. And then that gives us the cue to make the experience even more addictive to fully hook them and then convert them in as a customer. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, so I guess going back to the data, you're looking at that data and thinking like, okay, what does our audience care about? What don't they care about? I guess on your end, um, let's talk about data bias. It's, and this is a question from an autonomous, uh, anonymous attendee. They said, both explicit and implicit across different gender, sexuality, ethnicity, et cetera, as to provide the best, most accurate and fair product to your customer. So how are you looking into that and gender bias? I think this is a great question and I would love to hear Shelby's answer on it because I'm super, I'm super interested in it, but there's a lot of old school data points that we still use to rule our lives that are super racist, like BMI, like different metrics like that. So I think this, this question is really important and whoever asked it, thank you. Shelby, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, yeah, this is my favorite question and I've assured you I did not sneak it like, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I did not add this question to answer it myself, but um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, the data bias things, I really love that over the last, uh, you know, few years, I think there's been a lot of attention on this topic. And I want to sort of go back to what, you know, how, how it actually starts in the first place. Like anytime there's something that's inaccurate, incomplete or misleading, that is bad data. And that bad data can cause a lot of people downstream to make bad decisions. So I think there's this sort of myth that, um, you know, there's something in the data that's telling me to do a bad thing, but really there's something that's just not there or you, or something that's just not well understood that can cause people to make decisions based on it, which are just harmful. So, you know, people can make decisions about their products saying, um, I know that 80% of the people want me to do this. So this is a good area for me to invest in. But what that is really telling you is that 80% of the people that you have reached to that actually you know, added that data point, like the ones who were motivated enough to answer a survey or maybe use the product, like those are the people who are telling you to do that. And doubling down on that, using that as a justification to double down on whatever it is that you're trying to build um, is, is, is just, it's, it's inaccurate because you're not addressing the need for the bigger community. Um, and maybe it's because you're not even reaching out to the, that larger community in the first place. And instead you're reaching out to those, you know, that little tiny sliver of the community that you have access to that's telling you to do something, but it's a very self-service servicing thing that they're telling you to do. They're not, they're not really thinking about everybody else uh, in the first place. So I feel like those type of situations, um, you know, back to Jordan's point about um, how machine learning and AI can be used in fitness. Um, I think, I think like I would really pitch for the industry to be very careful in how a lot of those things are used because um, a lot of these decisions have consequences to real people's health and basing, you know, basing decisions um, um, based on sort of incomplete information is, 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 it, it really can cause a lot of downstream issues. One very quick example is just um, sort of, uh, you know, as, um, like heart, heart, uh, heart disease was not well understood with women. They make up half the population, but the study has never really included our data points. So the symptoms and things like that were always very well understood for men. And that led to more women dying of a heart attack than men. And that's, that's like, when you think about it, it's horrifying that like it, it was, it was caused because of lack of data. And now you trace that back to like actual sort of fitness products, which are again, basing their sort of recommendations of what your heart rate should be back on that, on that data that was missing an entire gender from the, from the study. Like it's, it's, it really, it really does have a lot of capacity to cause harm. And that's why we should be very careful when we sort of think about these things that we're automating, that we're classifying people into about what is the worst that can happen? Like what is the absolute worst case scenario? And if that scenario is harmless, okay, fine, go ahead. But like really push yourself to sort of think about that, that consequence before, before you sort of step out and, um, you know, code it into the, into the product, so to say. I agree. And I think that like bias in tech, especially like using things like machine learning and AI is so it happens so easily because, um, 
that's how bias is passed on between people. It, it is the same thing in programs that you actually build and manage. Um, and there was a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, and it was about um, the developers who created like the like button, um, the guy who monetized Facebook and built the ad marketplace and things like that. And they talked about being developers and creating these functions to build addictive response, like call and response behavior types and these different social apps. Um, and then once they did that, how they got better and better and better and better because of AI and machine learning, but what that ultimately did to people's psychosis and their mental health. And it has a technology has a real tangible effect on how you feel in your body as a person. So to Shelby's point, I think it's super important that any any company <coughs> looking to get into that game has to be super, super aware of the contextual surroundings and what the ultimate end game is because what we can't forget through all of this is what are we using the tech to do? It's to modify human behavior, right? And the person who is building the tech is the person who in their mind knows what that human behavior is supposed to look like. And when you build tech to change the way people think, breathe, move, and act, um, you take control of their lives in a way. And if you know your intentions aren't pure, or if you haven't thought about every circumstance that could happen afterwards, like Shelby said, you have a real effect on people's health and well-being, um, and you're responsible for what happens next. So it's really important. Absolutely. Were you going to add something, Jordan? Oh yeah, I was just going to just add, yeah, maybe it's a slightly different point. I mean, I think when we most of us think about fitness, we're thinking about lifting weights and running and biking, and rowing, whatever, you know, whatever it might, like an actual sort of workout activity, swimming. Um, but like thinking about, you know, sort of the universe of people who are uh, looking to work out or get in shape, there's a lot of, a lot of times that doesn't appeal to a lot of people. And so even things like uh, tennis and uh, and golf, right, can be a, a fun way for people to exercise and get in shape. And so it was kind of felt like just the definition of the fitness industry is kind of narrowing um, for a lot of a lot of people. And uh, we, one of our investments is kind company called Tennybot. That's uh, it's a tennis company. You wouldn't think that it's kind of fitness related, but I, I do think about it in that way. Uh, tennis can be a great workout and it's an AI machine, machine vision company um, that creates an autonomous robot that goes around like Zoom Roomba for, for tennis. It picks up your tennis balls for you and brings them to you. And then you can shoot it over the net. And um, when, when you hit it over the net, there's uh, the ball, you know, the robot will pick up the balls, bring it to a shooter, shoot it back to you, tracks all of your makes and misses. It actually enables you to play tennis by yourself. And you don't need to have someone else now because you don't need to have someone hitting the ball back to you and you don't need to spend half your time picking up balls. And so that now becomes a way that people can get a you know, a workout in that's, that's very interesting, sort of leverages AI and, and, and machine vision. And um, just, I don't know, kind of, I guess the point is thinking about AI as it applies to not just like at home fitness or, or, or gym space, but also to any sort of activity that could be a sport or something else that could be a workout. Um, and to have people, especially now that we can, uh, hopefully we're nearing the end of COVID and not everything has to be in your house. There's a lot of ways that people can work out and get in shape outside of uh, you know tr traditional fitness forms. So that's definitely yeah. something that's top of mind for us. Uh, we have room for one more question, and this one is the push for personalization. So we see with every piece of technology, we're gearing towards personalization, whether it's the color or down to the buttons. And um, I would love to know in terms of personalization, maybe Lou, you can answer this, especially with the uh, the way that you're working on a subscription program, like how, how do you guys personalize for each user? Is that a problem in a sense where it's not focusing on the community more of a person and how do you go back and forth between personal and then community? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I think personalization has, and, and customization too, I saw there was a question about customization. I think both are have become sort of table stakes for most services. So, um, there's some nuance in figuring out the, the right way to personalize, but I think examples for Fitbit Premium are, you know, we can show customers their health data, uh, whether it's their sleep score or their stress score. Um, and, and this is a very data focused, here's your last seven days, here's your trend. Um, and then right underneath that, we can say recommended for you, you know, here are some things you can do to get better quality sleep or to reduce your stress. And, and this can range from like, one-time moments of let's try some mindfulness uh, sessions to to more of like programs that span multiple weeks, which is like, hey, let's help you get in the habit of 
uh, ramping down your phone before you go to bed, like turning down your lights um, and, and getting yourself ready for good sleep hygiene. Um, and so a lot of these things can be personalized based on both, both, again, demographic information about the customer and how they behave in the app, I think are really simple ways to help personalize. But I do think that has become uh, table stakes. So it's uh, like, like we know customers expect that from us. They, they want us to recommend things for them that are uh, personalized to them. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's also another way where you get the users to continue staying and coming back for more when they get those personalizations. Um, awesome. Well, this has been the end of our panel. Um, so informative, so great. I need to go run um, and kind of get my life together after this. We've been sitting all for a long time, but um, thank you all so much. If you guys all want to leave a link to where everyone can connect with you, that'd be great as well. Um, and if they have any questions, I'm sure they can find you based on that link. Awesome. Cool. Thank Thanks, everyone. For that session. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.